Welcome to this short lecture on fishing. I'm Dr. Corey Fackleris at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Our lecture here will meet one of our learning objectives for this module, which is to understand current best practices for mitigating common attacks. Much of online malicious content is what we call phishing, and we sometimes call it smishing. This is a form of online identity theft that employs both social engineering and technical subterfuge to steal consumers' personal identity data and financial account credentials. While only about 2.9% of employees click on fish, and that's according to Verizon's data breach investigations report in 2022, even one is enough to compromise security. There are different types of these scams. One is called social phishing, and in that case, it appears to come to be a legitimate email and to come from an employer, HR, a friend, or somebody else who you're socially connected to and have a reason to get an email from. Another type is spear phishing. That's where you're targeting sets of users using some existing knowledge. When we say smishing, that comes from um, mobile messaging and specifically SMS delivery of specific text scams. But it's kind of a catch-all term, and so it might not be SMS, but a lot of times uh, we still say smishing when it is a mobile scam. For example, seven UNC Charlotte staffers fell for this particular phishing attack. Now, at that time, our domain was uncc.edu. And so even today, of course, with charlotte.edu, if you look at um, the top line there, you'll see that uh, that email does not come from somebody within our system. So that's one thing to look for and to weigh when you're thinking, is this a legitimate email? The second is at the bottom, and you'll see there are spoofed links and websites commonly found in phishing emails. In this case, it can be a little difficult to spot, because but if you hover over a link, you can usually find out what is the specific URL. In this case, it uses some words that look familiar, but the root of the URL, which is the, the very end um, before the slash of, of the email address, you see there's pullman-bable.ac.id. That does not seem like something that is a legitimate domain. And so that's a big tip off that this is a scam. Phishing variants are associated with what we call pretexting. So in security awareness, we describe this as a made up scenario where threat actors typically ask victims for certain information, stating that it is needed to confirm the victim's identity. So in this case, the scammer would be impersonating a trusted party, such as another employee or a vendor commonly. 71% in one study of these pretexting scams requested a gift card. 6% uh, we could describe as a payroll diversion and 14% requested direct tr bank transfers. And some common gift cards that scammers have asked for are Google Play, Steam Wallet, Amazon, but I think today too, you'll see other types also. Here's a specific gift card phishing scam that popped up at the University of Iowa. And so like a lot of universities, we find that these campaigns um, can target a number of recipients, um, but also they're going to be responding um, from a lot of different departments as well. This could be research professors, IT directors, even custodians. And so a lot of times when we're security professionals, we wanna follow up with the staff who respond to these emails. And that's critical to ensure the scam doesn't continue and that no gift cards are actually purchased. And also you'll be able to help the affected staffers at your company uh, if, if you find that they've responded to these emails. So there's a number of techniques uh, that we know scammers employ, especially in phishing that are described on this flyer. So for example, foot in the door, this is a really well-known persuasive technique where you have a small ask from a person such as asking for their cell phone number to initiate the conversation. And then you'll pivot to what you really want, in this case, asking for the gift cards. Another hallmark of a lot of phishing scams and scams in general is this sense of urgency that they try to put into you. So I'm in the meeting and can't get away, for instance, like this is why it's so critical that you send this gift card now. 
And also a lot of times um, seniority or authority is another tactic that we use in persuasion and that scammers will co-opt. This tends to effectively play on the power dynamic between a sender and recipient, as they say here. So you see here, there's a faked sender name and that in this case, pretending to be a senior executive. Um, you see too, there is an external account, a Gmail account in this case. And so notice the external tag on the subject line, a lot of times now in the email systems, we do add that flag external to help you figure out that it does not come from a legitimate inside email. There is a signature block though, that is attempting to recreate the authenticity of an official email. And there is a short request in the body or subject, like quick request, can I have a moment? That's also something they're trying to imitate what actually happens in our enterprise communications where we're super busy, we don't have time to explain ourselves. So after billions in spending, and I can't underline how much uh, time and attention we've all given to this problem, why does phishing still work? Well, the thing is people haven't changed we still have cognitive biases and cognitive overload that attackers can exploit. So what I mean by that is first of all, a lot of times attackers are playing on those things we've already talked about that we're hardwired uh, to reason through or to be misled by, such as for instance, that sense of urgency that sometimes overwhelms our reasoning. And also when we're multitasking, we're doing a lot of work at once, that cognitive overload, that means there's not a lot of resources in our head left over to stop and think, wait a second, this could be a scam. And fish actually are extremely well designed visually to mimic credible messages. They usually copy images and page designs from the real thing. They try to use similar domain names so that unless we're reading very carefully, we can't figure it out. They're hiding the URLs most of the time. And they also use some very deceptive hyperlinks. There's actually a study that was done in 2015 to examine this, why phishing still works and what are the user strategies for combating phishing attacks. In this case, in this simulation, only 53% of phishing sites were detected by the participants. And they found that users uh, were judging sites based on the content of the message, as well as the fact that sometimes it was, beset, was sent um, through links that used SSL, a secure socket layer communication, which sometimes does not mean that it's not a scam because scammers can use these protocols too. And so think about it, you know, our attention all the time has bounds on it. And the cues that uh, we need to look at, such as URLs or the from field in an email, they're hard to pay attention to, and it's hard to notice actually when they're absent. And of course, attackers are going to reduce our attention even more through creating that sense of urgency, making it sound kind of scary, such as if you think your boss uh, is upset with you, and also through creating a sense of familiarity. And finally, there's a sense of confirmation bias here, right? That if we get the email, we're kind of automatically thinking, well, I've seen emails like this before. This one must be very similar. Um, there's many other types of communication attacks too that exploit our social and cognitive biases. So fake attachments have been on the rise for several years. So it's not necessarily that the, the that we need to avoid a link, but we need to avoid some sort of malicious download or some sort of redirect to a phishing page. And the worst ones I think are the ones that execute even without any action on the user's part whatsoever. We've seen a lot of ransomware too delivered by emails and text messages. It's been commonly used on cities and municipalities with more than 200,000 organizations being reported being attacked in 2019 with an average payment requested of $84,000. And there's a story in the New York Times here linked if you wanna read more. Also, a lot of times now too, we see messaging used for extortion and blackmail scams where they claim to have compromising content about you, such as nude photos. And it could also um, contain some other personal information to make it look more real, such as old passwords found in a data breach or some family names that were scraped from your social media postings. 
Well, this is a very short roundup of the types of phishing attacks that we're likely, first of all, to have to defend against and also to help our users to avoid. I hope to discuss this more with you in class.